מרתק, וגם כל מיני דברים שאמרו חז"ל, פתאום אני מבינה אותם באור אחר, שהם הרבה יותר קדומים. אני שמחה להזמין את פרופסור ארמין לנגה, אורח שלנו של הקבוצה, פרופסור ליהדות בית שני באוניברסיטה של וינה, שאני לא אעריך עכשיו בהצגתו כדי לשמוע אותו, אבל חיבר ספרים רבים, החל מקהלת וכלה במגילות קומראן ועוסק בתולדות הטקסט המקראי. ועורך וחבר מערכת כמעט בכל כתב עת שעוסק ביהדות העתיקה באירופה ויזם גדול ואני רוצה להוסיף עוד משהו שלא תמיד אפשר לזהות אצל חוקר גם את המוטיבציה הפנימית הנפשית שלו לדברים שהוא עוסק בהם ואצל ארמין אפשר לראות ליד ההתעניינות שלו בעת העתיקה גם אה, מעורבות חזקה מאוד במה שקורה בעולם היום ובאירופה היום. אה, ארמין עוסק היום בחקר האנטישמיות החל מן העת העתיקה, כי הוא מודאג מאוד ומוטרד מאוד מתהליכים בעולם של היום, והוא אה, בצד המחקר שלו עסוק מאוד ב, במאבק באנטישמיות כפי שהיא אה, מתפתחת היום. אז uh, The topic I want to speak about tonight is not so nice. <laughs> Jews were killed in Kansas. Jews were killed in Brussels. Jews were killed in Jerusalem. Jews were killed in Paris. Jews were killed in Copenhagen. These are just a few cases of about a time span of one year of extreme physical violence against Jews. Only 70 years after the Shoah, the festival of Purim is scarily up to date. In about two weeks, Jews all over the world will celebrate Purim. Purim is a festival that, next to merrymaking, commemorates how Jews were delivered from genocide. As part of the Purim celebrations, the Book of Esther will be read in synagogues. The third chapter of Esther reports that all Persian officials venerated Haman when the Persian emperor appointed him as vizier. Lutz spoke about this at length. The Hebrew word which is used here is mishtachavim, In other texts of the Bible, the same word describes the veneration of God or of pagan deities. The only official who did not venerate Haman was Mordechai. As a consequence, Haman obtained an edict from his emperor ordering the genocide of all Jews in the Persian world. The historicity of the Book of Esther The historicity of the Book of Esther is debated among scholars, and it remains unclear until today which acts of persecution the Book of Esther responds to. The veneration of a high state official reminds me personally of Hellenistic god-kings like Alexander the Great or his successors the Diadochi. Whatever the historical context of the Book of Esther, It cannot be denied that already in antiquity, Esther speaks about an anti-Semitic edict, i.e. an anti-Semitic law, issued by a Persian emperor. According to Esther 3, the cause of this law was a religious conflict, namely that a Jew refused to venerate a human being with divine honors. Anti-Semitism has many faces, 
and employs many different strategies to slander, derogate, persecute, harm and murder Jews. Physical violence and even attempted or real genocide often go hand in hand with other forms of persecution. As the Book of Esther shows, anti-Semitic legislation was and is one of them. The history of anti-Semitic legislation is long and more than sad. To my shame, Christianity contributed to many parts of it. Today I want to engage with two examples of Christian anti-Semitic legislation. I want to speak about a novella to the Justinian Law Code and about Visigothic anti-Semitic law and canon law. First, Visigothic legislation against Jews. Some of you might wonder who the Visigoths were, at least my students wonder all the time. The Visigoths were part of the Germanic group of the Goths. During the migration period, they sacked Rome in 410 CE and settled eventually in today's southern France, Spain and Portugal. In 507, the Visigothic Kingdom was reduced to the era of today's Spain and Portugal. In 711 or 712, the Arabs conquered Spain and ended Visigothic rule. In addition, you should know that the, Visig the Visigoths belonged until 587 to the Aryan branch of Christianity. Although Jews were disadvantaged in Aryan Christianity as well, the conversion of the Visigoths to Catholicism in 587 had devastating consequences for the Jews of the Spanish Peninsula. The Visigoths issued a series of anti-Semitic laws which became ever more vicious. Visigothic secular law needed to be authorized by the councils of the Catholic Church which was done in a series of 17 councils of Toledo. These councils added to the viciously anti-Semitic secular Lex Visigotorum equally vicious clerical anti-Semitic legislation. King Sisebut, forgive my pronunciation, I have no idea how these names need to be pronounced. King Sisebut ordered the enforced conversion of all Jews to Christianity. Although the Fourth Council of Toledo, Toledo prohibited forced convers conversions to Christianity as a response to Zisibut's measure, it compelled, compelled all baptized Jews to remain inside the Catholic Church. In the following legislation, both the Lex Visigotorum and the Councils of Toledo did not distinguish between Jews and people of Jewish origin who converted to Christianity, for forced or voluntary. Now this is very important. Both groups are in the Visigothic laws often designated as Jews. Ethnic origin and Jewish religious identity blur into each other. Visigothic anti-Semitism is thus both a religious and a racist hatred of Jews. But the radically changed attitude of the Visigothic government and legislation towards Jews since the conversion of the Visigoths to Catholicism leaves little doubt about the religious motivation of Visigothic anti-Semitism. After the Sixth Council of Toledo, King Chintilla allowed only Catholics to live in Spain. Converted Jews needed to declare their Catholic faith in a kind of signed public oath called placitum. In the following, the Visigoths and the Catholic Church controlled Jewish converts to assure that they celebrate Christian holidays properly and do not remain Jews in disguise. Visigothic law prohibited any aspect of Jewish life, 
violation of this anti-Semitic legislation was often punished by exile or death. A life sentence of slavery was considered clemency in these laws. The anti-Semitic measures of the Visigoths remind me of the time of the Inquisition and foreshadow many aspects even of the Shoah, such as the Nuremberg race laws. Anybody who tells you that anti-Semitism is an invention of modernity just needs to look here. To even list, sorry, to even list the many secular and religious anti-Semitic laws of the Visigoths would by far exceed my time today. Instead, I would like to quote you one secular law and a passage from the Placitum of the Sixth Council, Council of Toledo as examples for how the interpretation of scripture was an instrumental part of at least some Visigothic anti-Semitic legislation. In the law 12 to 8 of the Visigothic Law Code, King Rekeswind prohibits Jews to observe their dietary laws and forces them to eat what Spanish Christians eat. Now you have all these texts here on the slide, except to see some me messages from my Skype. <laughs> um, and I'm not going to read them to you. First of all, some of this I simply cannot convince myself to pronounce. And second, it's very long-winded. The prohibition of kashrut in this law is a good example for how Visigothic anti-Semitic laws were developed out of the Christian Bible. It is based on the letter of Titus, to be more precise, 115. Being sent to Titus on the island of Crete, the letter of Titus attacks in its first chapter both Cretan philosophy and Jewish tradition. The author of the letter of Titus asks not to pay, quote, attention to Jewish myths or to commandments of those who reject the truth, end of quote. The Titus quote you see here on the slide in the Visigothic law um, this Titus quote follows 114 directly. The letter of Titus abolishes thus with a concept of purity and impurity as directed by Jewish law. For the letter of Titus only the purity of the believer is decisive. A defiled and unbelieving person would remain defiled whether he observes purity regu regulations or not. The passage in the letter of Titus is itself at least derogative towards Jews, if not worse. The Visigothic law transforms the New Testament text, though, into anti-Semitic legislation. It picks individual elements of the Titus quote and relates them to the life of Spanish Jews. The Latin coinquitnatis, coinquitnatis, them that are defiled, is identified as judeorum detestabilis vita, the detestable life of the Jews. These are just a few examples of the really hateful rhetoric of these texts. Because the letter of Titus claims that nothing is pure to the defiled, Jewish purity regulations become for the Visigothic law a discretionis horrende, a dreadful discrimination. I refuse to reiterate further elements of the debauched rhetoric of the Visigothic law. The rhetoric leaves no doubt about its hatred of Jews. By way, of his reference to a text in the New Testament that is already derogatory to Jewish halacha, the Visigothic king feels empowered to condemn Jewish purity laws in extreme language. Beyond any insinuation made in the letter of Titus, King Rekeswind also enacts anti-Semitic measurements with catastrophic consequences. 
any form of kashrut is prohibited in Spain. And the Jews of Spain and the forced conversos are compelled to eat what Christians eat, most likely pork, among other things. Every Jew who did not follow this law was threatened with quote, punish the punishments instituted, end of quote. This phrase refers to paragraph 12 to 11 of the Lex Visigotorum. Violation of the Vis Visigothic anti kashrut law is thus threatened with stoning to death or burning. The only form of clemency would be disownment and lifelong slavery without a chance for manumission. I personally think, if you forgive my non-scholarly comment, that the Visigothic authors of this law should have experienced their own clemency. This Visigothic law, like many others, is an example for how religion and exegesis can be abused for most horrendous purposes. Both exegesis and religion are as such neither good nor bad. In the case of the Visigothic legislation, Christianity became a religion whose confession was at least in part that Jews are bad people. For Visigo Visigothic Catholics, Jews were, as the Fourth Council of Toledo stated in varying rhetoric, progeny of the devil. You find this, for example, in Canons 58 and 61. The Sixth Council, uh, sorry, the Sixth Council of Toledo met in the year 638. It forced Jews, in this case people of Jewish origin, who converted voluntarily or under compulsion. Remember, they don't distinguish. So it forced these conversos to swear and sign a public oath, a so-called placitum, in which they needed to forfeit any aspect of Jewish life, condemn Judaism in a most derogatory language, and confess to various dogmata of the Catholic Christian faith. The placitum includes a brief review of Israel's supposed criminal history against God's acts of salvation, which, according to Visigothic view, had its first peak in the blood level. Blood level, sorry, you have it here on the slide. The second peak of supposed Jewish depravity is that despite their forced conversion and baptism, Jews held on to Judaism and, here, and adhered to its customs and practices. The Placitum addresses various prohibitions of Jewish practices and halachic reg regulations, among them kashrut. Um, where is it? You can read it here. Jews were forced to swear that they would distance themselves from any other Jews, even in litigation and legal proceedings. Violations of their oaths were punished by stonings to be executed by the Jews who signed the placitum themselves. Uh, I have problems thinking up any more gruesome things than this. As part of the measures of the Placitum, the Jews of Toledo needed to promise that all would submit this, that they would all submit the scriptures in their synagogues for inspection by Christian officials. As this text is becoming important later, I'm going to read it to you. So, quote, we undertake to present to your inspection all the scriptures that are customarily held by our nation in the synagogues for the sake of the doctrine, those which are authoritative as well as those they call deuteras and those they name apocrypha, in order that, they not, that not even a vestige of malodorous suspicion shall remain with us. We solemnly undertake to despise and abominate the places of prayer which we have venerated until now in the Jewish rite. End of quote. The literature of Spanish Jews is grouped here into three types. Scriptures withhold, 
which hold authority, most likely biblical books, the Deuterosas and Apocrypha, the latter most likely being deuterocanonical texts. This remark of the Placitum alone is invaluable for the reconstruction of Jewish life and religion in pre-Arabic Spain. Today I want to alert you only to the fact that the scriptures in question were all kept in a synagogue and that immediately after the Placitum reads, regulates the inspection of Jewish scriptures, the Jews of Toledo need to disavow their frequenting of, pl frequenting of places of worship which they formerly used. The scriptures in question seem thus to have been connected with synagogues and probably synagogue worship. By way of uh, the synagogue, these scriptures disseminated a given interpretation of the Hebrew Bible, which in the opinion of the Visigothic Catholic Church contradicted Christian readings of the Bible. Hence the prohibition. The group of literature called Deuterosas is most likely an early kind of rabbinic texts. I will come back to this question later. The reference to scriptures show the references to scriptures show that an interpretative conflict about the Hebrew Bible is at the heart of Visigothic anti-Semitism. In their perverse logic, Visigothic laws and canons accuse Jews to have crucified Christ and to have rejected God's acts of salvation through Christ. In doing so, Jews would have rejected the promises that God made to the patriarchs. The Jewish rejection of enforced baptism and their continued Jewish practice, practice would be just the latest illustration of the so-called Jewish perfidy. Jews, on the other hand, applied a more literal reading to the Jewish scriptures, which did not envision Jesus as the promised Messiah, and rejected the generalization of God's promises to his people as including all Christians. Visigothic church law and secular law responded violently to this interpretative conflict by the ordinances I've discussed above and by other legal means. For the Visigoths, Jews as murderers of Christ needed to be persecuted and Judaism needed to be eradicated either by banishment or enforced conversion. The Visigothic interpretation of the Bible resulted thus in brutal anti-Semitic religious legislation which attempted to eradicate Judaism in Spain. Sorry. Now to the 146th novella of the Justinian Law Code. The Codex Justinianus, or Justinian Law Code, developed in four parts from 529 to 565 on the initiative and sponsorship of the Emperor Justinian. It consists of four parts, and I will not go into detail here concerning all of them. What interests me today are the novelle Constitutionis, etc., or in English, simply novels. A part of these novels is the 146 novella, which was issued in the year 553 CE. It responds to an inquiry if Jews are allowed to use a Greek translation of the Torah during synagogue service, most probably Aquila's translation. Already in the preface of this novella, it becomes clear that Justinian took the opportunity to create a law that reaches much further than the original request. Again, I'm not going to read you all of these texts. <laughs> Why the course of the 146 novella might have been infighting inside a synagogue community, Justinian's motivation for it was to achieve a Christian and Christocentric interpretation of the Jewish scriptures in Judaism itself. The severity of Justinian's legis legislation becomes apparent in the text of the novella and its epilogue, which include a draconic punishment to enforce Christian dogma on Judaism. I'm just going to read you here the heading of the Latin version, which speaks for itself. 
The Hebrews shall be permitted to read the sacred scriptures according to their tradition in Latin or Greek or any other language, and that those shall be expelled, now comes the punishment, from their place who do not believe in the last judgment or in the resurrection or that the angels are creatures of God. End of quote. On the whole, Justinian rules that Jews are allowed to read the Torah in any language spoken in any district of the empire, namely, quote, in any language that is more suited and better known to the hearers in each locality, end of quote. In Greek, though, they are only allowed to use the Septuagint and Aquila. Just for those of you who don't know, there were more Greek translations around. Those who do not follow Justinian's law are threatened with corporal punishment as well as loss of property. That's again a quote from the novella. Justinian gives a detailed reason for this legislation. It was right and proper that the Hebrews, when listening to the holy books, should not adhere to the literary writings, but look for the prophecies contained in them, through which they announce the great God and Savior of the human race, Jesus Christ. End of quote. This sentence emphasizes the main interest of the novella, i.e. to convince Jews of a Christian interpretation of their scriptures. There can be little doubt that this Christian interpretation was supersessionist, understanding Jesus as the aim and fulfillment of the promises of the Hebrew Bible. <laughs> this becomes all the more clear when Justinian recommends the Septuagint as the Greek translation of choice. I'm only quoting a part of this longer text. Apart from these who will not be amazed by this thing about these men who lived a long time before the saving revelation of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, yet carried out the translation of the holy books as if they saw that this revelation was to happen in the future and was illuminated by prophetic grace. Justinian understands the Septuagint translation as a prophecy of Christ, namely as a text which communicates the Christian dogma he wants to impose on the Jewish subjects of his law. The 146th novella is therefore not just concerned with a simple question which translation to use in synagogue service. It tries to legally enforce a Christian um, interpretation of the Septuagint in light of the New Testament. Although the latter is not mentioned by Justinian, this understanding of the Septuagint leaves little doubt that an interpretary interpretatory conflict is at the heart of this novella. So we're back to the same problem as with the Visigothic laws. The 146th novella wants to enforce a Christian dogmatic interpretation of the Hebrew Bible on the one hand, but wants to exclude Jewish readings of it on the other hand. For this purpose, Justinian prohibits in the second paragraph of the novella's first chapter, the Deuterosis. You might want to read this text here on the slide. As in the Visigothic Placitum, the text called Deuterosis in the 146th novella is used in a synagogue context. Justinian characterizes it as not being part of the Holy Scriptures i.e. as not belonging to either the Jewish or the Christian Bible. Different from the Visigothic Placitum, Justinian gives a characterization of the Deuterosis. It would be, quote, an invention of man in their chatter. It would be, again, quote, only about earthly things and would have, the last quote, nothing divine in it which text the term deuterosis designates, is extensively debated among scholars. That the Visigothic Placitum distinguish it, distinguishes it from the Bible and the Apocrypha shows that it is a corpus of text. Because Justinian puts the deuterosis into opposition with sacred books, it 
presents most likely an authoritative collection of texts. The slander of the 146 novella, which I just quoted, su suggests that this collection engages not with prophecy, but with halachic detail, i.e. what Justinian calls earthly things. That Justinian attacks the deuterosis as unwritten nonsense, nonsense, the Greek speaks of agraphus, the Latin of sine scriptis. So that Justinian ex um, attacks it as unwritten reminds of the concept of oral law. The deuterosis is hence a written text that claims to represent an orally transmitted halachic tradition. Given that the Greek word deuterosis as well as the Hebrew word mishnah are both derived from the numeral two, it seems most likely to me that Justinian prohibits in his 146 novella the reading and use of the mishnah. Um, that the term indeed refers to the Mishnah is, among others, supported by how, how Jerome uses it. I have given you here a quote on the slide. Justinian objects to the Mis Mishnah because it advocates a literal interpretation of the Hebrew Bible, which excludes a Christian reading of it as a prophecy of Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah. Instead, Justinian not only advocates, but even tries to enforce in his legislation a Christian understanding of the Hebrew Bible, which views the Jewish scriptures as forecasting Jesus as the Messiah. I.e., Justinian wants to legislate the understanding of the Jewish scriptures as the Old Testament. This Christian reading of the Old Testament is, according to Justinian, both uh, best grasped in the Septuagint, whose translators were for him divinely inspired after all. In the case of the 146 novella, Justinian's anti-Semitic legislation grows thus out of his Christian interpretation of the Hebrew Bible. To enforce his Christian reading on Judaism, he even goes so far as to prohibit a key component of the Jewish cultural memory, namely the Mishnah. Just a few conclusions. I wanted to show you how, bo how Christian anti-Semitic legislation in late antiquity mos was motivated by religious prejudice against and religious condemnation of Jews, and how Christians rationalized the legal persecution of Jews by deducting some of their anti-Semitic la laws out of a distorted exegesis of the Christian Bible. The Book of Esther marks the beginning of a long history of anti-Semitic legislation. That anti-Semitic legislation was motivated by religion is evident both in the case of the Visigoths and the Justinian Code. Religion can be both most precious and full of hatred. One aspect of anti-Semitism that is evident in anti-Semitic legislation to, uh, um, is that it is a negative religion whose confession is that the Jews are the sons of the devil. It was this religious hatred which expressed itself in late ancient legislation against Jews. This religious hatred is at work in contemporary anti-Semitism as, as well. And it is my opinion that only when we recognize the religious element of anti-Semitism, we can fight it better. Thank you so much.